most accounting firms assume their existing client base as a given and they look at ways of growing it. I think in this day and age, you need to be thinking both ways about that equation. That is, if you're not providing these services and somebody mm. else is, can you afford not to? And if, if that's what it takes to motivate you, that's still a good thing. Whatever, whatever makes you move forward. Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to The Deal Room Podcast. Today, we have a special two-part series about the amazing world of financial modelling. In these two episodes, we've brought in Michael Hutchins from the software company Modano. Michael is an ex-investment banker, professional financial modeller, software developing CEO, and in these next two episodes, discusses Modano's software and the nuances of financial modelling in sales and acquisitions transactions. If you aren't much into figures, perhaps this topic may not sound highly exciting, but I promise you that if you're involved at all with strategic company decisions or you're an accountant or other business advisor, you're really in for an interesting next two episodes. I love talking with Michael. He's a ball of energy. He certainly makes the topic of financial modelling extremely interesting. And in these next two episodes, he shares some great insights into ways to get far deeper insights into a company's financials and how to use financials to help plan for the future and to make proper decisions for the future. In part one of this two-part series, we start with the fundamentals, looking at what financial modelling is why it's important, and where the real value lies. We discuss how financial modelling can provide the opportunity to take an understanding of your business to a whole new level and give you the ability to look into the future and test ideas you might have about how to grow the business. In part two, we discuss how financial modelling can help you test the true likely impact of a merger or acquisition and give you the ability to anticipate various scenarios. But in this part one, we discuss the underlying elements and how financial modelling can be used to give you your best and worst case scenario at any point in time. We discussed how it can be used to provide clear metrics and drivers about how you need to run your business. And we also look at ways to use financial modelling to make your staff more accountable. The topics we discuss in part one of this series are extremely relevant to any business that is looking to grow and to understand how they can get deep insight into the impact of pulling various different levers in their business. It's also essential listening for accountants as Michael shares many insights into the opportunities for them to add incredible value and extra income streams to their practice. We discuss the many challenges facing accounting practices and the reason holding many accounting practices back from jumping on to these new opportunities. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for coming on to the show today to talk about your software and the nuances of financial modelling in sales and acquisitions transactions. So welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great. Look, could you perhaps start off by giving a bit of a background of you and perhaps of Madano as well? Yeah, I suppose my history is quite unique in that I, I started off as an investment banker, which is where I think most people try and end up. End up, And I started off as a banker and decided I'd leave and, and try and improve financial modeling. So I was working on M&A transactions in the utility sector, mm-hmm. mainly doing energy, basically electricity and gas regulated asset modeling. And my mother was a professor of mathematics at Melbourne University, and I've always loved numbers. And I thought it would be done incredibly well in investment banking, but it was, it was actually done pretty haphazardly. Wow. So I thought, thought I'd take a year off banking and see if I could fix modeling. And one of my clients offered me quite a lot of money to do that for a year. And I thought, well, I'm 25. I'll probably come back to banking and do an MBA. And that was 15 years ago. So I started a consulting company after a lot of other clients wanted models built. Mm. And then ultimately, after four or five years of that, in about 2005, six, started realizing that there was an opportunity to create software to to improve the way models were built. So for the last decade, I've I've been focusing on building 
financial modeling software so that more people can more efficiently and more effectively build financial models the way investment banks do. Mm. So now I'm effectively a, I'm an ex-investment banker, professional financial modeler, software developing CEO. So I'm a bit of a weird mixture. That's a great combination. Yeah. Yeah. No. I love it. <laughs> yeah. No, people, I mean, people love models. It's just that most people don't know how to build them, but, um, yeah. but everyone wants a model and everyone wants to learn how to models. It's a really interesting space to be in because there just hasn't been the type of evolution there has been in, in other areas of technology. And I think there's just huge opportunities, obviously, which which we've spoken about previously. Mm, yeah. Well, look, let's maybe start then at the basics about why. Why is financial modelling important? And particularly, I guess we're talking today particularly about the sales and acquisition space, but why is financial modelling important in this space, I guess, both for buyers and for sellers? Yeah, I mean, I think financial modelling, it's a really interesting area because it's forward looking. And I think if you look at particularly the accounting space, it's always been about predominantly compliance and backwards looking. So how did you go last year? Maybe one or two quarters out. You know, how's, how's your next BAS payment looking? But they really don't look at the future in terms of what happens if we borrow some money or what happens if we acquire another business and we actually go big with this business. So I think financial modeling goes to the core of the exciting part of business, which is the future mm-hmm. and what you achieve. Yeah. And I think it also is exciting because it brings together lots of different skills. So you, you could be a tax accountant, you could be a, a specialist valuation, you know, a valuation specialist in a specific sector, but you still don't really understand a lot about the different parts of a business, tax, valuation, accounting. So financial modeling, it's a really interesting area because it requires you to have a really strong understanding of how businesses work and effectively how they will change if you make different decisions. Mm. So it's, it's very much decision-based cause and effect analysis. And that means you're really, really strategic focused. So the financial modeling area is one where, you know, I think, I think accounting firms in particular um, haven't done as much of it as they could because they've always been focused on the, on what's happening today and what's happening with your reporting. Whereas financial modeling is, is looks at what, what could you do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And I think you look at, I mean, the, probably the most exposure I ever had to financial modeling when I was younger was working alongside companies like Macquarie Bank. And the first thing I noticed coming out of university was that Macquarie Bank they, they literally obsessed over building high quality financial models. And they did that because they realized it gave them the most clarity and understanding of the client's businesses. And then you contrast that with, with accounting firms that I've worked with since leaving banking. And a lot of them, they don't go to that level of detail and they don't, they don't have a strong understanding of, of the way that the businesses work. So financial modeling, I think, really takes things to a whole nother level in terms of the depth of the understanding of businesses. Mm. That's why, and that's why it's becoming such a powerful thing and I think a real focus for a, lot of, for a lot of businesses and advisors. And it's interesting because what you're essentially saying is that this is something that can be a fundamental value add. You know, I, I hear accountants talking all the time. I talk with them all the time about the issues in being business that is built around these compliance aspects, you know, and often looking for ways that they can value add, particularly given issues with technology these days impacting mm. the way accounting practices will look into the future, into the short term future, really. I guess you're talking here about true ways of value adding. Oh, it's, it's an extraordinary dynamic at the moment because and I think it's one based more on the past than the future. And that's that accounting firms very much consider themselves I think, on a core level compliance offices. Uh, and they consider the, their core responsibility is to make sure that their, their firms and their advisors, their corporate clients, they meet their obligations to the tax office predominantly and also to, to the shareholders and reporting. Whereas, you know, the funniest thing I've found about that is that, is that they don't realize the position they're in. They've, they're effectively at the foundation of the company's numbers, yet a lot of them haven't taken that to that next level, which is advisory. Mm. And, and, there's, and obviously there's conflicts there. And that's where you know, a lot of conversations I have with accounting firms, they talk about if we're doing assurance, can we then do advisory? But there are different levels of advisory. When you're talking mergers and acquisitions, for example, there can be conflicts, particularly with the success fees. Mm. But there's a lot of analysis that companies need on a day-by-day basis that is quite strategic to help them run their businesses that isn't transaction focused and doesn't involve conflicts of interest. And a great example of that is is helping a company understand what its balance sheet and cash position will look like in three, six, 12, 24 months based on a set of assumptions about how they're going to run their business and the decisions they're going to make. And that's where I think there's a huge opportunity for the accounting firms because they've already got the historical data. They've already got the relationship. They've already got a pretty good understanding of the business. They just need to make it more forward looking. And that's, and it's funny because I think there's at the moment you've got two extremes. You've got accounting firms on one end that a lot of them are just doing tax and compliance and it's lower margin and it's, and it's relatively boring for a lot of them. A lot of them want to be more a part of the company's strategy. And at the other end, you've got you have a whole range of different advisors from the Macquarie Bank, you know, extremely expensive, extremely sophisticated advisors 
right through to effectively a lot of bedroom advisors. Like there are a lot of ex- investment bankers out there that are charging ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to help companies raise money and do all sorts of transactions mm. because they're able to do the financial modeling component. Mm. So we're seeing a really really strange, abnormal market right now where you've got all these opportunities to help companies because they just don't have an opportunity to get it from their accountants. Mm. And that's, I suppose, I naively thought I could walk out of investment banking, empower accountants and turn them into strategic advisors. But there's a lot deeper emotional discussions that need to take place there because a lot of accountants, they've never really thought about working with their clients in that way. And that's where it's so interesting, obviously, speaking with you over the last over the last year is that you work with a lot of accountants mm. and just learning about their mentality and how many of them want to change this dynamic because there's so many opportunities there. I think there's a lot of talk about the desire to look at these opportunities and to look at their clients, businesses, as I said before, in ways that they can value add more. But I, I think when it comes to the nuts and the bolts of this area, you know, sometimes maybe it just becomes too complex. You know, accountants are busy. They're involved in practices that they have so many things that they're doing on a daily basis. And so perhaps sometimes it's the complexity that is a greater concern for them. And and perhaps for them, the opportunity doesn't look as real and ready as the the complexity that they feel will get them to that point. But I guess what messages might you have if accountants are grappling with these sorts of considerations and decisions and issues right at the moment? Well, that's, I mean, what you just alluded to there is, is the absolute core of the issue with accountants. And that is that, that it's not simple stuff, financial modeling. And we, we take for granted coming out of investment banking that it's a skill that, that evolves over time uh, that you can tell someone who's been modeling for uh, six months versus one month. It's, it's not something you can teach somebody in a week and, and everyone has the same skill set. And it's not as black and white. It, it requires a lot of initiative and a lot of thought. So different people are differently suited to modeling. Like we've hired a lot of people to work in our consulting team over the last 10 or 20 years. And some people just haven't been able to do it very well because they just don't think the way you need to think as a modeler. So it's certainly not not the easiest skill to pick up. And I think for accounting firms as well, it, it's, as you're saying, it's, it's a big investment in a bit of an unknown. So we've spoken to some really small accounting firms and they've just been unable to convince their clients to invest in realistically to build a good financial model. You might need to spend even for a small business five or $10,000 in time so you're looking at 20, 30, 40 hours of analyzing the business, looking at the drivers of the business, and then and working out how to represent that effectively in a spreadsheet. And a lot of smaller businesses don't have the budget for that and probably don't have the sophistication for it. So you sort of, you sort of need to work out which clients it's most suited to. And when you've done that, you then need to actually commit to having somebody upskill. And you know, we released our first financial modeling software about 10 years ago, and it really was a cult product used by the Goldman Sachs is our first client was one of the first clients was Goldman Sachs because they just got it straight away. But then we sort of naively went out to small accounting firms and said, hey, you can do what Goldman Sachs is doing. And the accountants turned around and said, wow, we don't understand anything about what you're talking about. And we realized that there's fundamental differences of thought as to how you analyze a business using a financial model and, and debits and credits and general ledgers. So what is simple to somebody who's been financial modeling for 6, 12, 24 months or 10 years is a completely different mindset to somebody who's been doing tax compliance. So, I mean, we've, we've spent the last, I think, what, two years building, effectively gamifying training courses on our website because we're trying to make it exciting for accountants. Mm. And we have these extraordinary conversations where I say, I'll say to an accountant, when I was in investment banking, it took me six months of late nights to get my head around the first model I built, which was of a, a natural gas pipeline, which doesn't sound exciting, but it's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting modeling because a lot of these pipelines, sure. they're, they're, they're regulated and they play these games with the regulators to see if they can get their, their prices and their volumes up then, because that determines their pricing path and stuff. So it's, it's really interesting stuff if you love analyzing businesses. But when you turn around and look at teaching that skill to an accountant, you really need to start from scratch and say, where do you even start building a model? And building a financial model, if you're forecasting a company's performance, you start off with their opening balance sheet. And then you have to say, okay, let's forecast each part of the business. And you need to know how they interact. So you need to look at, say, its revenues and expenses. And then you've got to work down through its working capital, work down through its asset base and depreciation, and then look at its capital structure and tax, whether it's got GST, consequences involved, whether you're going to bother model those. There's a whole different mentality you need to teach. And we've recently got the fundamentals down to about 20 hours of training. And I constantly get feedback from accounting firms that they don't want to take a staff member off client work for 20 hours. Mm. Uh, And I turn around and say, well, I'll give you a case study. You know, we went to a a mid-tier firm that's actually probably not mid-tier, probably top 10, probably the lower part of the top 10. And we said to them, you guys should start doing more modeling. And so they gave us one guy who was a real go-getter. He went away and spent half his weekend doing all this training. 
And then he came back and said, listen, I, I'm pretty comfortable with what you've shown me, but I'm not quite sure how I can apply that to my client. So we effectively partnered with this firm. It was a mandate for about a $20,000 model build. And they outsourced about $5,000 of the fees to our consulting business. And we effectively handheld this guy through his first build. The second project, he used about $3,000 worth of handholding. And the third project, he used about one. And for the last six months, he hasn't used us at all. And he's been doing ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 mandates for his firm. And this is an analyst who's on a salary of probably sixty dollars or $70,000 a year, who's probably going to bring in between one fifty dollars and $200,000 worth of modeling fees this year for his firm and creating whole new relationships with, with those clients. So you know, our ambition with that firm was to have all of the staff trained up on modeling so they could proactively push it. But at the moment, they're doing what a lot of accounting firms are doing. They've got a modeling guy and he does their modeling for the, for all their clients. Hmm. And I think for a lot of accounting firms, you know, that's, that's the a, way in, isn't it? That's, that's the start. Yeah. Find the go-getter, find hmm. the go-getter the guy who actually wants to spend his Sunday learning a new skill. And it, it's not an easy thing to sell because if you just look on LinkedIn for two minutes, there's so many people looking for financial modelers to help in their businesses. And I mean, I'll be the first to say that my consulting firm charges a lot of money for it. For a, a secondment to a large company like Origin Energy, we might charge one and a half to three thousand dollars a day, depending on how complex the model is. So, so the big end of town pays a lot of money for this. But the thing is, the small end of town still has a budget for this. What a, what a lot of small businesses are doing is they're hiring effectively grey-haired CFOs that have great experience in their their sector, but they don't have a lot of experience in financial modelling. So you've got a, you've got a part-time CFO who you're paying say 40, 60 grand a year to to come in one or two days a week and help run your business, but he's unable to give you a tool that you can use when he's not there to run scenarios. Mm. There's an opportunity for accounting firms really is to provide that service as effectively a non-transaction specific advisory ongoing relationship. Mm, yeah. So to really hone in, I guess, on, on the clients that potentially can drive the most value in their own practice. So they've got the client base, they've got the clients. It's just about adding these services on to drive greater value, but also to uplift that fee component in relation to these particular clients who otherwise might go elsewhere. And, and that's what, what you just got to. There's a really interesting thing is that you want to upsell some staff. It's really interesting how the, the accounting firms have the relationship of trust. Mm. And that's funny because if you walk in, if I walk into a corporate and say, hi, I'm Michael Hutchins. I'm a great modeler. Let me model your business. A lot of them are really scared of even showing you the financials because they're like, who is this guy? Mm. But with the accounting firms, they've already got that relationship of trust. The accounting firm has already seen all their numbers. They've probably worked with them for five years. So if the accounting firm can demonstrate that they've got the skill to build a model, which you can do pretty easily once you know how to model, it's a very easy next step. So it's, um, that's why we're, we're trying to work with accounting firms rather than trying to compete with them because we think they've got a much quicker path to adoption than we have trying to convince clients to trust us without an existing relationship. Mm. And so I guess for accountants, then it's wrapping their heads around, you know, because I, I can almost feel some of the reactions of our listeners to, oh, that sounds like a lot of time and effort. Mm. But when you talk about this example that you have of the employees, so it doesn't have to be the partner or the owners who are dealing with this, they may choose, as you say, a, a young go-getter in this mm. example, you had one employee who threw themselves into a weekend of training, then mm. came back and was able to dive into fee production income right from the get-go and now has built up a one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 pool of potential revenue that relates to this modeling, mm. right? So there's the opportunity. Well, yeah. And what's amazing is that this is happening even though these firms aren't pushing it really hard. So I'll give you a great example of... Um, I'm trying to avoid naming our clients because I don't know whether they'd love or hate it, but we've got, <laughs> we've got, we've got, a, we've got a long-standing user out in, out in New Zealand in Auckland, and it's actually part of a big firm globally, but they're a small firm that weren't doing a lot of modeling. So they're just effectively a, a small satellite part of that, that business globally. Mm. And those guys decided that, hey, we've got a whole lot of high net worth individual clients. A lot of these guys are CFOs and CEOs of companies that they own, yet all we're doing is their personal tax. So they started saying, how can we get involved in their companies? And they were doing obviously some of their corporate tax as well. And these are companies that turn over you know, I'm surprised how many companies in New Zealand turn over 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. And a lot of them are privately held companies. Mm. And a lot of them don't have a proper budget and planning process. So they've got something like zero going. And they might have some basic add-ons to zero. A lot of the add-ons to zero are really, really handy, but they're not really the same quality you'd get from an investment banking financial model. They don't give you a proper balance sheet, cash flow and, and an income statement forecast. But they're getting closer, but they're still a while away because it, it's complicated stuff. And it's different for every business. So this firm went out to their clients and they started saying, listen, firstly, they, they trained up on our system and they invested a lot of time in that. They invested two or three of their guys over the period of about two or three weeks intensively working with us. And, and we wanted to do this as a test case for ourselves as well. And then what they did is they ran info sessions for their clients. 
So they, they rang all their clients and they said, hey, we're, we're going to start providing financial modeling services. It's basically what if analysis for your business. It's pretty cool stuff. They shot them over examples of generic models. And even those, they impress most people because most people just haven't seen high quality models unless you've been working with a big four or an investment bank. Mm. So they sort, of, they sort of got them excited, inspired them, then got them in a room, said, bring along a laptop. We're going to walk through a monthly planning model and we're going to roll it forward, import new data. We're going to run some scenarios and then we're going to do a valuation and we're going to show you some dashboards you can include and then how you can customize this model. And basically what happens then is the clients then go away and come back a few weeks later and say, listen, we're looking at doing a capital raising. We've realized that our, our spreadsheet really isn't even a proper model. What you guys showed us is incredible. We want one. And it's funny because the, the end product becomes almost like a web development business. But instead of developing and maintaining a website for a client, you're maintaining the tool that they use to run their business. Mm. So what that company's now been doing in New Zealand for the last, what, three years is maintaining what we call rolling integrated three-way models. So models that roll each month, mm. import their zero or QuickBooks and wild data, and effectively are integrated. They contain full income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow, and they contain a whole range of forecast assumptions. So they can do budget to actual versus forecast, do reforecasting, and at any point in time, you can track your progress against how you thought you would go and then reevaluate how you think you're going to go in the future. So it just gives you this, this real clarity of your business and the ability to make decisions much, much faster. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, let's talk about then about the real, the real benefits to the end client, the end user here of having proper financial modeling in place. I guess, as, as you said, just then it gives clarity, but, but what else does it give? You know, what are, what are the real benefits? It's such an interesting thing. When I, when I was in banking, I became obsessed with building the, the most complex model in the world of one of our businesses. And I was surrounded by all these really smart guys. And one of them was like the ducks of his school who'd won this mass prize and I was showing off how, how complex my model was. And he turned around to me and said, um, and said you know, the challenge with modeling is, is, is actually making it really helpful for the client. And he said, mm. if I asked you how much money you spent on lunch, how much you'll spend on lunch in the next 12 months, you could sit down and spend a day mapping out exactly where you think you might eat lunch each day and what you might eat each day at each place you go to. You could probably then, and then they're not asking you to run a scenario and it would probably take you a day or two because you'd have to reevaluate, you know, what if you're in, what if you go and live in Sydney? Oh, I'm going to have to change all my assumptions. Whereas then he said, you know, or you could sit down and say, I'm at work 250 days of the year. On average, I think I spend $16 a day on lunch because I get a sandwich and a, and a drink. So th there's a really basic example that you can run a scenario on quite quickly and say, what if I spend $18? Oh, bang, it's an extra, the extra X hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So financial modeling, it's a skill in that you need to make it valuable for the client. And then one of the risks that people get into when they start doing it is they make things way too complicated. But if you get it right, it's incredibly powerful stuff. It gives you not so much an answer, but an understanding of your best and worst case scenario at any point in time. So I'll give you an example of our consulting business. Our consulting business has anywhere between 10 and 15 staff, depending on you know, how, how busy we are and whether we're using contractors. And we basically have a model that shows for each staff member and each project, how many hours they're, they're looking at charging over the next three to six months. And then we have a pipeline assumption about how many new clients we're going to pick up, what spend they'll incur and what the probability is that they'll actually follow through with the project. So we realized early on that we put in a whole lot of projects and we said, listen, this, this client will, will almost certainly spend $50,000 over the next six months. And then we realized in actual fact, quite often projects would, GFC would happen and people mm. would pull out of projects. So we, we started making our pipeline probability weighted. So we now have a probability weighted pipeline for new projects and existing projects, we put about an 80% probability of completion on them. So we have a, what we call a probability weighted projection which we use as the basis for forecasting just our balance sheet and cash flow. But then we have an upside scenario, which is if, if no projects drop off at all, and we have a downside scenario where every client runs to the hills. And, and, and then we're able to look at how much cash, we, how long we'd be able to survive on a cash flow basis in each instance. Mm. So, and, and that's given us a whole bunch of ratios that show us exactly what our financial livelihood is based on our future likely performance. And what that enables us to do is then gauge whether we need to hire or potentially let go of staff. Because we've mm -hmm. now got to the point where we have metrics where we can say, we know for a fact that if we, if we have less than 60% utilization on average of our staff across the board for three months, we are going to burn our cash. So that either means we need to increase sales or potentially let go of staff. So you end up having really clear metrics and drivers uh, about how you need to run your business. And it also means you can hold your staff and yourself accountable. And the, the biggest problem with a lot of smaller businesses that, that makes them struggle to grow beyond that owner-operator stage is that the owner is got, has it all in his head. And as they hire staff and grow, they, they don't have accountability. They don't have proper budgeting and planning, and they lose an understanding of their business. All the mm -hmm. understanding is trapped within the head of the owner, who's often the busiest guy in the company. 
So financial modeling goes to the core of successful businesses. And I mean, we see with our big clients like Origin Energy, I mean, they do some incredible stuff. If you look at our Origin Energy's annual report, they have a section in there that is one of the coolest things I've seen, which says what we said we'd do for the last quarter of the last year, what we did, and why we did or didn't hit or miss. So you can actually look at the annual report and, and they basically are mapping out their roadmap so clearly that each step of the way they assess whether they achieved their goals and if they did or didn't, why that was the case. And, and when you look at the most successful businesses in the world, they've, they've done that from a very early stage in their growth cycle. And whether it's something like a JB Hi-Fi that analyzed, which and we worked with JB Hi-Fi for years, and they're now huge. And they looked at, for example, where to open new stores geographically, what, what times of the, of the year people were buying different products. Mm. And it's the same with something like a Grilled. We worked with Grilled over the years and, and Grilled basically looked at which stores at which times of the week, at which times of the year sold different products and services and used that to gauge which staff you needed to have on at different times of the week to maximize profitability. I mean, the businesses that are successful aren't doing it by accident. They're, they've got a very clear roadmap and a very strong understanding of their, of their businesses and their core operations. And, and this is something which I think accountants assume that you have to be a Wall Street investment banker to do this stuff. But the vast majority of strategic advisory is just core understanding of the business. So working capital, assets, tax position, cash flows, profitability. And those are things which, which should be done on, on a real-time basis. And that's really where the accountants can add value. Well, that's it for part one of our two-part series into the wonderful world of financial modelling. As a quick recap, in this episode, we heard from the wonderful Michael Hutchins from Medano about how financial modelling is future-looking, as opposed to many methods of looking at a business that are backwards-looking. We discussed the opportunity for business owners and accountants to use financial modelling to look at the future and anticipate what might happen if you acquire another business or if you make certain changes to the business. It's essentially a way to road test the viability of ideas before you commit to them. So hopefully you found this background to financial modelling concepts interesting. Stay tuned for part two in this two-part series where we talk in far more detail about the ways in which financial modelling helps businesses plan for the future, the benefit of proper financial modelling in an M&A environment, how modelling can help identify when acquisitions might be a good strategy for growth, and how they can provide a good way to test the impact of a merger or acquisition. And on the flip side, why and how businesses can get themselves in a transaction-ready state. But until then, if you'd like more information about this topic, head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com where you'll be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you want to read it in more details. You'll find details there of how to contact Michael at Modano. There you will also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of sales or acquisitions. We have a number of great services that help businesses both prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We also have a range of services to help guide businesses through the sales and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you want to find out how we might be able to assist. Thanks for listening in. You have been listening to Joanna Oki on The Deal Room Podcast. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.